Hello, I'm Jay Strack, and welcome to There's Always a Way podcast. And of course, when you launch a new podcast, you think long and hard, who would be some of the very first people I want to interview to make a difference in the life of our listeners? And obviously, somebody's going to make me look good by having them on, so that's very important. But also, who could add a lot of value to you as you try to make a decision on what to listen to and what to read because there's quite a few options out there. So I am very grateful to introduce you to Jeff Struker. Jeff, uh, thank you for being with us, and I'm grateful for uh, you taking this time. Jay, it's always an honor to be with you, because you make me look good, and I try to make you look good. Well, man, where have you been all my life? Uh, right. I need, all the, I need all the help I can get. Now, Jeff, I know by now, uh, you people just think that either Black Hawk Down is your middle name or it's your last name because it seems like no matter where you go, what you do, I mean, we're talking about quite a few degrees, a PhD, in fact. Uh, we're talking about being in the Ranger Hall of Fame. Now, I was in uh, Mrs. Strong's detention, detention hall in, in the seventh grade Hall of Fame. You're in the Ranger Hall. I mean, so I just want our folks that are listening, we'll talk about that as we go forward, but of all the things you've accomplished, and of course the ministry and your family, so many things, yet I'm amazed that because of the book and because of the movie, uh, that's just part of how you're introduced. So uh, this is Jeff Struker from Black Hawk Down. He's a hero, and I wanna be very serious here for a moment. Uh, I have a lot of heroes. Uh, Jeff and I have a game room filled with memorabilia, uh, from the, the greats and my favorites mm -hmm. in baseball, football, basketball, WWF, WWE, you know, and golf, all the key sports, right? Uh, so I, I have a lot of heroes. I have heroes in, in, my, in my office. I've got signatures, our, our pictures, our books, you know, of people that in the past that are heroes. But, you know, as I think about heroes, I think some of the ones that I get the most out of are those that are my age or much younger, those that are that I know. And so I don't use that word lightly. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, self-serving in any way, nor am I trying to be overly gracious, but you're one of those that uh, obviously much younger than me, but when I look at your life, I look at the books you've written and, and all that you stand for, and most of what you've done, what you've done not only for our country, but what you continue to do. Uh, I don't think there's any question. Uh, I look at you as one of those heroes, and I mean that word sincerely. So you, not, just, not just Black Hawk Down, but uh, lots, come on, lots come around and a lot of things have been demanding since then. Uh, you've had the award as the Army's top ranger. Uh, then you were an Army chaplain. You've been in the military for 22 years, and I think the last 10 as a chaplain, that had to be quite a transition. It was, yes, sir. So with that background, and then of course, I've already alluded to the chaplaincy and the role that takes on in addition. And you know what I'm learning? You still have to be a soldier. That's right. <laughs> you still have to carry whatever needs to be carried. You still have to report when everybody else reports. And then in addition to that, uh, the role of a chaplain. So I, and we've got a lot to delve into there. But Jeff, I just want to ask you a question. The podcast is called When There's Always, or That There Is Always a Way. And mm -hmm. I believe that. And I believe that's one of the great characteristics of those who make a difference in the world. They believe there's always a way. But I want to ask you, what's the first thing that comes to mind, leaps to mind, when you see or hear that phrase, there's always a way? Yeah, it immediately takes me back to my days serving as a ranger, both as a sergeant in the Army's Ranger Regiment and then as a chaplain with those rangers. Um, because there really are a unique group of guys and gals, and they are the kind of folks that have um, kind of committed their life to no matter what the mission, no matter how difficult or how dangerous, we're going to find a way to get it done. Because if we can't get it done, it won't get done. And so, rangers 
um, from day one starts by serving in this unit, this special operations unit called the 75th Ranger Regiment, with the mindset, there has to be a way. We will give our lives to find the way to get this done. Because as I said, if we can't do it, it just isn't it going to happen. And now our nas national security, the future of our country is at stake. So, yeah, I believe it too. There's always a way. Well, you know, one of the things that I was fascinated by was, you know, we hear about Black Hawk Down and, you know, we know the movie and we see us, uh, when I say us, see representing America, but going in. And it's not uh, trying to intervene. It's not trying to force our will. It's not even our foreign policy. That was pretty, that was a pretty noble assignment, what you guys got asked to do. And I know you went in with the mentality, there's no telling what we're gonna have to do to pull this off. But I think a lot of times we may forget, why were we there? Why were, why were you and your men sent in when you were? Yeah, great question. And I'm gonna go right back to your word hero a second ago. I don't really like that word when it's referred to me, but I will say this, I had the chance to serve with a lot of heroes. Some of those guys were with me in Somalia. And you're right, America is a good country. We're a noble country. Where other nations, if you look back over human history, they go to war for gold, or they go to war to get more land, or they go to war for glory. America sends troops when there's a problem, and they send them into some of the most dangerous situations to make people's lives better. So it's, it's hard to get this from that first 10 or 15 seconds of the movie Black Hawk Down when there's some script going across the screen. But the thing that eventually led to me and my friends getting sent over to Somalia was hundreds of thousands of people dying from starvation because of a famine that was affecting most of Africa. And this country on the Horn of Africa called Somalia, it was decimated by this famine. And the country didn't really have a government or a police force. So there's no military to stop guys with guns from doing whatever they wanted. And pretty soon the United Nations and the US showed up to try to feed starving people. Literally, the only thing that we were trying to do is just keep people alive. We wanted nothing in return. And then all of a sudden, some of those armed warlords over there started targeting United Nations and US workers. Hmm. Then in the summer of 1993, one of those warlords attacked and ambushed the United Nations workers that were handing out food to his own people, which caused the United Nations Security Council to meet. And they said, we have to do something about this. I'm going to use the word lunatic. They didn't use that word. A guy by the name of Mohammed Farah ID. So my unit and this special operations task force got sent to Somalia to go catch ID and bring him to justice for murdering these innocent United Nations workers. And again, we're not looking for gold. We're not trying to get land out of this. We don't want glory. We just want to help people that are dying of, fam of starvation. That's ultimately what uh, led to the U.S. getting involved uh, with Marines landing on the beaches um, on the very first day. Wow. Well, you know, I, I'm privileged and uh... Uh, as you know, to take students to Normandy. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about the bravery, right? And uh, we have a little discussion sometimes. Uh, I had to correct myself for many years. As somebody that is this huge fan, if you will, and, and supporter of what all our military does, but yet I would say, you know, can you just imagine students being the very first ones out? Mm -hmm. I mean, what courage did it take? I mean, you had no idea what was gonna happen. You have no idea what's waiting for you. And yet you begin to see and hear all the guns, the explosions, and then you step out and you've got on too much equipment and you probably sink. I mean, and it, sink or swim is literally uh, yeah. there. Out. So I always talked about the bravery uh, uh, and the courage had to be greater than any other group. Yeah. But after about six years of standing on that beach, telling the story, hearing the numbers, of what actually happened on those beaches. I began to think, what about those that were the, some of the last to yeah. climb out of that? And they opened the door of the carrier, of the people carrier there. And all of a sudden, all you see is blood red. Right. And you can walk to shore on the bodies. Yeah. 
And I said, students, I want to correct myself. I believe it took more courage to be some of the last to go ashore when you know what the outcome yeah. is even, maybe even a little greater if it's yeah. possible to, to differentiate like that. Yeah, Jay, you and I had a chance to sit at, uh, on the beach in Normandy, France and eat a baguette and just think it's hard for even you and I to imagine what this would have felt like when they dropped those ramps on those landing craft and the first couple of guys got off those ramps and it was nothing but machine guns and pillboxes and an entire continent of people that were trying to kill you. But you're right. Those landing craft kept coming and those bodies kept falling and the, the people kept getting off and um, Americans and Canadians and Brits and French kept going uh, wave after wave across that beach. And I, I I consider Normandy, France, one of the most sacred spots on earth, just because of what was accomplished there when, uh, when we liberated. This is the, the point that started the liberation of an entire continent. Well, you, um, Jeff, you uh, have written a book called The Road to Unafraid. And that's, I mean, what a great title. But when I first realized that's what the title was. My first comment to my wife was, man, he didn't need to say the road to unaf unafraid. He needed to just talk about one word, Mosh, how do you even say it? Moshadishu, Mo you're right. Mogadishu, yeah. yeah. Moshadishu. And every time I hear that word, all I think about is gangs and pirates. Mm -hmm. And that's even before seeing the movie Black, Black Hawk yeah. So you could have just simply had that one word on your book and it would have said, I mean, for me, that would, you know. So as you spent the night, and I know that was a long, long time, what is counted maybe in hours or a day and a half, but it had to seem like years. Yeah. Describe for a moment, because I noticed one of the chapters, you know, you're talking about uh, questions in the night. Mm -hmm. and then you're talking about uh, into the unknown and first, I mean, all those things we can only imagine, but when you've been there, what does that mean? What, what is it you were conveying? Yeah. Well, first of all, Jay, I'm not smart enough to figure out a good title like that. The publishing company did that for me. Um, but my whole goal in writing this book was to help men deal with fear. Cause I've been around guys, tough guys, some of the world's strongest, toughest guys my whole life. And us guys are not really willing to admit that we have fear. We all know we do, but we just don't like to say it. So this book was about um, saying, look, I've been around the toughest guys in the world and all of us get afraid, get scared from time to time. How do you deal with that fear? And of course, I use my story from Somalia and a couple of other combat en en engagements to talk about this in the book. And for me, Somalia was not my first combat tour. I'd been in the army for six years. I was a squad leader with 10 men that I was responsible for, but I had already been to the invasion of Panama in 1989. I'd already been to uh, Kuwait in 1991. And so I had, I'd seen bloodshed. I'd been in firefights. I carried body bags before getting to Somalia. But for most of the guys that I was with, even some of them that have been in the army for a lot longer than me, this is the first time that they've ever gone to war. So part of what I felt like I had to do is I was the 24 year old old guy in the unit with a little bit of combat experience. And I felt like I had to help these guys get ready. But I don't think any of us, except for one or two really high ranking um, leaders had the kind of combat experience from Vietnam the rest of us had never experienced this intense of a gunfight. You know, in Panama, somebody locked themselves in their own handcuffs and turned themselves into me. In Kuwait, they were surrendering by the tens of thousands because we had basically bombed them so much that they didn't want any more war by the time that we, we rolled across the border. In Somalia, they were ready to die. They were ready to kill anybody that moved. They were ready to sacrifice quite literally, their own women and children, whatever it took, um, not for ideological reasons, just because this was part of the culture at the time. And in, uh, in the big battle that becomes the book in the movie Black Hawk Down, we've now been in 
five, seven, six, seven other combat engagements by the time this rolls around. But still, most of our guys have not been shot at like this. And we put about 200 guys on the ground, about 100 people in the air in helicopters against, we didn't know these numbers at the time, but probably somewhere around 10 to 20,000 armed Somalis. And most of the gunfight was done door to door and across the a street from one another. In other words, 20 feet away. It wasn't done over, a, a, you know, hundreds of yards of desert. It was done right in front of your face. And whoever pulls the trigger lives. And first, whoever pulls the trigger first lives. Whoever pulls the trigger last dies. And most of my friends um, and I rolled back out in the city streets multiple times all night long, stayed out there until nine o'clock the next morning, fighting for our lives and just basically trying to keep each other alive and get each other out of the city um, as many as we could of our dead, our wounded and our, our fellow comrades out of the city. That's really what happens after the first 45 minutes or an hour of this mission. Wow. Well, Jeff, I can tell you from the movie, from the book, and then, of course, from being privileged to hear you share your story several times, um, the one thing that I always just kind of have a shiver over is that moment when you've got nothing left in the tank, you've finally gotten back, you've gotten the wounded back, I mean, you've done everything you can, you've lost men, You've, uh, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you, there's nothing left to mm -hmm. all, let's leave me alone. And then those words, there's a man left behind. Mm -hmm. And you talk about what those words mean to uh, those of you in service, that yeah. we never leave a man behind. Right. But hearing those words at that moment, that had to be uh, a moment yeah. frozen in time. Yeah, Jake, for me, that was one of the most um, significant moments of my life. Because as you just said, um, Rangers have sworn their lives, literally almost every day, get up and they pledge their lives to one another in what's called the Ranger Creed. And one of the things the Ranger Creed says is that I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. So as you just mentioned, I'm in this city, I'm getting shot at, the guys behind me just get killed, my vehicle is shot to pieces, I make it back to the base, I'm dropping off the wounded, and my platoon leader says, Jeff, we've just had a second helicopter that got shot down. We've already put our search and rescue force in at the first helicopter crash site. Now we don't have anybody else who can go back out to the second crash site. I need you to get your men and go back out to the crash site where Mike Durant's helicopter crashed. And for me, immediately what I was thinking is, this is a suicide mission. I just barely made it out of the city streets with my own life, and I've already lost some of my men. If we go back out there, we're gonna die. And then the paradox comes, if I don't go out there, the guys that are stuck out there are gonna die. If I go back out there, it's almost certain that I'm gonna die. What do you do? And uh, I'm saying this because this is who I am at the core of my being. Every fiber of my being believes this, but at this moment, I needed supernatural help. So this is where my faith becomes extremely important because I settled eternity long before I joined the army. I surrendered my soul to Jesus Christ. And so when I am at this point of deciding to go back out into the city streets, I'm really making this is the decision, God, I know I'm gonna die. And God, I believe that you have already saved my eternal soul. I am convinced that I'm gonna spend eternity with you in heaven. So God, whatever happens next, I trust it in your hands. And as you've given me the chance to talk to some of your students from time to time, Jay, I tell them this is where I experienced a sense of peace that I've never really known before or since. It was just total calm. I know I'm going to die, but I'm not at all worried about it. Just go out there and do your job and save those guys that are out in the city streets. And for me, that sense of peace became one of the things that prompted me to eventually write that book, The Road to Unafraid. How do you have, how do you have peace in the midst of of a chaos like that? And the answer is, 
you got to have peace. You got to believe in something bigger than yourself. Well, Jeff, that one, one story, that one episode that you share and you paint, uh, Walt Disney said that we need to learn to communicate by painting word pictures. Yeah. And I can assure you, uh, you've painted that picture, both in your description that you've written in on a road to unafraid. I mean, you feel like you're right there. I, to show you how my, uh, a D D D D D brain works. I'm thinking about, man, I'm trying to have that peace when I'm running late and the traffic's really, mm -hmm. or I'm trying to have that peace when I'm, uh, running to catch a plane that's about to take off and yeah. people are counting on me. I've never obviously had that responsibility when, uh, uh, you get that peace, that overwhelming peace and knowing, you know, this is not just a feeling, this has got to be bone of your bone and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, part of your muscle. Your right. DNA. Yeah. So I appreciate the way you make faith so real. And we're not talking about a warm feeling or Sunday mm -hmm. morning or when you're holding your wife's hand in church. We're talking about when you wonder if you'll ever get to see your wife again. Right. Now, Jeff, for, my, for, our, for all those uh, listening or watching, uh, where, tell me about, pause for just a moment, married, how many children, what, what, where were you in that stage? You weren't just yeah. a young guy footloose and fancy free, I don't Thanks think. Thanks for bringing that up. So when I was in the invasion of Panama in 1989, I was single but desperately in love with my high school sweetheart. Got back from Panama and bought a ring and proposed. I went to Desert Storm while I was newly married. In fact, we had to rush the wedding just so that I could go to Kuwait. By 1993, we'd been married for a couple of years and we'd been trying to have a baby for a couple of years. And after getting to Somalia, I'd only been there for a few days, I got a letter in the mail saying, hey, surprise, I'm pregnant and we're gonna have a baby. And this was, I didn't expect the way that that impacted me because when I'm in, um, desert storm. I'm married and I'm thinking if I get shot, because I'm in a firefight, if I get shot, I married a beautiful woman, she's going to find another guy, she'll be fine. When I'm in Somalia, I'm thinking, wait a second, I got a baby on the way. And now if I get shot, this child is going to grow up and never know who their father is. And that weighed heavy on my heart. And as you know, Jay, I've had uh, my wife and I, Dawn, have been married now almost 30 years. We have five children. I went to many times to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've been thinking about those five children when I'm gone. Mm. And here's something that the Lord had to show me. Jeff, if you don't make it back from this combat deployment to Iraq, if you get shot on a hillside in Afghanistan, I will be a better father to your sons and daughters than you could ever be. Trust your children in my hands, and I'll take care of them. Wow. And I needed to know that because I was... I was thinking, what happens to my daughter when she's ready to date? What happens to my son when he's ready to start playing high school football if I get killed on a mountainside or on the city streets of, of uh, Baghdad? And God had to remind me, Jeff, I'm be a much better father than you are. You can wow. trust him in my hands. I'll take care of him. So this faith thing is a real part of your life. Yeah. It's, it's supposed are. to be real for most people that, that yeah. uh, understand what it really means. Yeah. Now, I, I'm just curious, was there words in there, guess what, we're going to have a baby, and you better get home safe. <laughs> One no. Week. Was there any of that? Look, at I'll tell you how old I am. This is back before we were, back before the internet, so we're writing letters back and forth, and somehow the letters got mixed up. I haven't really ever told this story before. So the, the letter number two and number three gets to me before letter number one. And letter number two says, when the baby, and I was like, there's something wrong with this letter. I read letter number three that says, hey, I'm getting ready for the baby. And I, I dropped that letter on the floor like it was burning my hands and said, I think we're, gonna about, we're about to have a baby. Letter number one shows up a couple of weeks later saying, surprise, I'm pregnant. Um, so it kind of caught me off guard because of the, the order that the letters showed up in the mail. They actually came off of the back of an Air Force airplane in a big red bag. They just threw them next to us and said, figure it out. Well, some of the places you've been uh, stationed or been serving, I would have just dropped it in a parachute and let it float down to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a couple things, quick answers. You ready? Sure. 
even heroes, is this what I'm hearing? Even heroes have to battle doubt, fear, anger, anxiety, and uh, great insecurity. Uh, yes, that, the answer is yes, but Jay, rather than be very quick, I'll, I'll uh, give it to you this way. You uh -huh. can't be a hero if you don't struggle with these things. Because by its very definition, the word hero says, I'm scared and I'm going to face my fears, my doubts, my anxiety anyway. You're a psychopath if you go through situations where, you're re where it's really intense and you're not afraid. I don't call that a hero, I call that a psychopath. Despite what Hollywood depicts, that's not real fear or that's not real courage, that's just insanity. Real courage is stepping up being a man or a woman that faces your fears and tackles them head on. That's a real hero. Now, Jeff, thank you, man. That's a great clarification. Now you let's, let's define another word leader, man. We know thousands of books have written. Yeah. One of my favorite lines is to remind people that I've been studying leadership a long time because I had, so far to go to even dream about being able to write uh, the word leader, much less try to be a leader. But uh, from uh, all the way from the leadership secrets of Attila the Hun, mm -hmm. all the way to Winnie the Pooh. Now, can you imagine there are the leadership secrets from A, almost, and then last time I was in Spain, there was a news, a little sentence in the newspaper that for some reason I saw, it said there's a new book coming out on the leadership secrets of Zorro. All right. Really? And so I go, man, to quote the British from A to Z. Now we're going to have, now I always tell people, if you're applying for a job or interviewing or whatever, and whoever is going to be your boss is reading the leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun, you may want to just El Paso on that, That's op right. on that op opportunity. But now, speaking of leadership, uh, I want to ask you a question. I wrote this down so I would uh, say it exactly right. Um, what does it mean if you're a leader that you have to be a good follower? What does that mean? Yeah, um, I would say leadership is a terrible privilege. I use these two words. They seem like they're contradictory on purpose. Right. There is a burden and a um, pressure that comes along with being a leader that those who follow you generally don't have to go through, shouldn't have to go through. That's the terrible part of it. The right. privilege part of it is you have the opportunity as a leader to make the, the, the lives better of those that follow you. So I don't really think you're qualified. I don't think you really should be a leader unless you have already demonstrated that you were a good follower because that means you know what it means to be in the shoes of the people that you're now leading. But I would take it a step further. You really need to keep being a good follower even as a leader. And now I'm saying you need to remember the decisions that you make affect the people that you lead and keep in mind what this feels like to them when you make those decisions. Certainly they don't have all of the information that you, don't, you have. They don't have to make the high pressure decisions that you make. But when you make those, consider the people that are following you when you make them. That's why the leader should have been a good follower, continues to be a good follower. I don't think you're, you're, you're capable of leading well if you're, if you're not a good follower as well. Now you've served, uh, from, as, we, as you discuss, from the invasion of Panama, which is critical, the Panama Canal, and a lot of other things going on at the time, uh, obviously Somalia, and then Operation Desert Storm, mm -hmm. and then tours in Iraq, right? So I must ask, who are one or two that you've met he, that are in leadership position? Now, I don't know uh, how well you got to be exposed to one of my favorite heroes, General Schwarzkopf. Uh -huh. You know, I know Colin Powell was involved mm -hmm. in Operation Desert Storm. I know Schwarzkopf was. Um, and then, but I know there may be a couple names, name, name, lead, you know, some people are names that we know. Uh, and then there may be one or two that uh, made a big yeah. impression on you that, that we wouldn't know. Sure. But uh, 
are there a couple named people yes. that you really meant something to you or yeah you there are um there i had the privilege of working with guys like stanley mccrystal and um admiral mcraven um i had the privilege of serving in panama under general colin powell and i am he is one of my favorite modern day politicians but also i respect the man because of the powell doctrine and the way that he sent warriors off to combat um, i had the chance to serve under guys like tommy franks but one of the generals that I've never had a chance to serve under, but I have the greatest respect for just watching what he did with his branch of service is the United States Marine Corps General Krulak. General Krulak, when he was the Commandant of the Marine Corps, really helped shape the Marine Corps of the future. These are some amazing leaders that had a big influence on me. I also serve with guys that most of your viewers, listeners won't recognize like um, Rich Clark and Jim Mingus and some other great leaders like that, but some military families, some army spouses, military spouses, they're also my heroes. I won't mention them by name, but the, the, the secret um, struggles that they go through, the, the pressures on the military family, almost nobody in America understands. And Jay, I believe we should put a monument on the National Mall to the military family. They deserve it. Wow. Well, I, I would agree with that. My wife recently led a, uh, a, a burden God put on her heart, kind of in response to the, all the angry women. I mean, you know, there's so much anger. Yeah. And not saying there weren't some things that women have a right to be angry about. <laughs> right. But they, it was, we were there, we got to see some of it, and it kind of morphed into a, a lot of things. And, 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 you know, I'm going, man, what's wrong with, I mean, you know how we are as men. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody needs to, you know. Somebody needs to fix I, this. Yeah, by the way, you want to have a protest? We'll get three times <laughs> that many women here. My wife goes, honey, uh, what you got to know is there's a lot of hurt here. Yeah. And they may not know the Heavenly Father. They may not yeah. have the comforter in their life. Yeah. They may not know what it's like to be forgiven for making a desperate choice and you didn't have all the facts and you were scared to death and you make a, a choice and then you have to live, you know, and, and yeah. my wife looking at those women uh, as a sister, I guess, but also as uh, with compassion really made me stop and think about how quick I am to judge certain people, yeah. you know, and if, especially by the reaction, we go, well, that's not right. Yeah. There's something wrong, real. but, uh, and obviously it can still not be right, but it doesn't dismiss. There's real pain there. And right. she That's said, right. what it's kind of our fault. Those of us that do have some peace in our life and feel like we found something that makes life helps us get through those moments that we've got to start just talking to each other. Yeah. To start praying for one another, right. not praying that everybody will vote the same or, or, or feel the same, but, we got to care enough about each other that they need to know somebody will listen to them, cares about them and will pray for them. You know, I agree. The, you know, so she started a, 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 a program, I guess if you would call it, you don't want to ever call what you do a movement. The minute you call yourself a movement, <laughs> disqualified from ever yeah. being one, right? right. But uh, it was a desire rather, I guess that's the best term. And it was one day and they decided they were going to pray ask women, and their goal was to have a million women to pray for women and women praying together. And so they had five speakers, mm -hmm. but one of the last one, and one of the ones that my, I know we'll forget this moment, Diane goes, we've got to add. I go, honey, you can't add, you're doing what I do. You can't add too, too many people there. And she goes, no, she said, our military spouses. Yeah. They are the unsung heroes. I don't they think. Are. I don't even, she said, I don't even think the government realizes what all they have to go through. Two or three children. And then yeah. you come on with this virus and yeah. all, I mean, so I love and applaud that idea yeah. about the movement was called She Loves Out Loud, which I love that I'm title. You very know. familiar with it. Tell, yeah. tell so, Diane we're proud of her. Well, thank you for that. Now, you talked about some incredible leaders and the role leaders have to influence others. Uh, we recently read and I've watched the, the president make kind of a bold move, really, in this mm -hmm. nobody I don't think has been as pro-military since, you know, it's been a while, I'll just simply say. Uh, but, you know, 
there is the captain of the Theodore Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And I found out and I was really shocked. Uh, you know, there are how many men I'm trying to remember 5,000. Is that right? On yeah, a lot. Let's put it this yeah, way. Yeah. A lot. There's a lot I've got. I can't read. That's it's why like I, a floating city. When you're dyslexic, this is the real uh, problem with uh, uh, taking notes. You know, you can't read your own notes. But uh, I mean, and he had over 100 cases on that ship. And they were, mm -hmm. I think, quarantined in Guam for a while. But he wrote a letter that warned of the dangers and ended up being released from duty. And in fact, kind of insulted by the Secretary of Navy. Yeah. I watched the president do something I never thought I would see that he would say, well, wait a minute. I think the man is a good man. I think the man's had a remarkable career. And it seems to me all he's trying to do is stand up for his men. Right. I want that. I want somebody that cares about the men, you know, and the, and the women yeah. on, on the ship. And then of course he said, now I realize there's a lot, you know, and the military has a code of conduct. I mean, you know, but I, I found it fascinating. And for many of us, it kind of exposed that chain of command. Yeah. yeah. And so I ask you, Jeff, is, uh, is somebody that's had to lead under fire, is somebody that's been a grunt, somebody that's been mm -hmm. a newbie, somebody that's been a, you know, a new recruit, raw recruit, whatever the term would be, to somebody that's seen great battle and been tested and been in leadership positions. Um, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, um, I'll say it this way. We like to have some friendly banter in the military, and the Army typically doesn't like the Navy. Rangers really don't like the SEALs. That's all like little ribbing and, and cutting up with each other. But in all honesty, I would go to work for this man any day because what this man really is demonstrating is real courage and real leadership. Real leadership says, God has given me a responsibility for the lives of my sailors, and many of their lives are now in jeopardy. And the courage in this case is not, might get blown out of the water by a foreign navy. This is a, I'm about to stand up and say something that is going to be politically incorrect. It may impact my career, and it may hurt my future. But my, my men and the men and women that serve under my command deserve it. And so I'm going to speak out. And this letter makes massive, gets massive media attention, which of course causes lots of scrutiny and ultimately causes him to be relieved. I believe every leader ought to show courage. And sometimes the hardest courage to show is moral courage, doing the right thing in the face of opposition. That's why. I would work with this guy or for this guy any day because he's showing the lives of my sailors are more important than my career. And Jay, if I can be honest with you, there's not a lot of leaders out there that would do what this guy did. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that he eventually got a second look at the decision that led to him uh, sending this letter because I believe the letter needed to be sent. And if you remember the news reports, his uh, sailors were when he walked off of that ship for the last time, walked down that, that uh, gangplank off the ship for the last time, there were tears in their eyes and they were applauding a leader who was willing to make a personal career sacrifice for their own safety and health. Wow. God knows we need more, more men and women leaders like that. Well, I guess that's uh, kind of circles back around to calling leadership a terrible privilege. privilege that has a burden yeah it really you know? is well jeff road to unafraid road to unafraid what's the great takeaway you want everyone who gets a chance to read the book i would encourage everyone if you if man if you're looking for something for you and your teenagers to read you're looking for something for your leadership personal leadership development you're looking for something to help you get a real sense of what our men and women go through under fire. I promise you this book for me, just kind of, you know, I got a leadership section. I got a political section. I got a military and so, you know, history, you know, section, this yeah. kind of, it's an author. I, I know you probably want me to get three by three copies in, <laughs> no. in each category, but uh, what's the one takeaway for our, 
uh, leaders. We have a lot of students yeah. that listen. We have pastors and youth pastors. And by the way, you've not only been a chaplain uh, for 10 plus years in the service, you've, uh, you've also been a uh, pastor mm -hmm. and uh, have pastored in a military yeah. town. On a, you know. So uh, what was the great takeaway, do you think, for businessmen, leaders, businesswomen, family? What's the takeaway? Yeah, um, you have two of my favorite politicians on your shelf behind you, Margaret Thatcher and Abraham Lincoln. Um, both of these, during very different stages of life in different countries, had to face intense challenges. And the essence of the book, The Road to Unafraid, is every one of us will get to a point in our life, most of us more than once, where we're in over our head. And there's no way I can figure this one out on my own. And the fear is now real. It's intense. It can be paralyzing. At those moments, you need help in something or someone bigger than yourself. So the whole purpose of this book is to point you to the one that is bigger than cancer or unemployment or divorce or uh you know, whatever the, the uh, intense thing that you'll face in the future, the one that can get you through that is the one that the great warrior poet King David referred to as the one who walks with me through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm, of course, referring to the God of the universe. We, I call him by his first name, Jesus, who, who can get you through this. Well, Jeff, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for what all you've done and uh, knowing a little bit about your schedule. Thank you for what all you're doing. Can't wait to see you again. You and your family be very safe. And remember, let me help you with this as an older, mature leader. There's always a way yes, to sir. a guy that probably got it tattooed somewhere. No, <laughs> anyway. That's Thanks, right. Jay. Yeah. Hey Jay, it's always great to be with you. I love you, man. And I'm proud of what you stand for. Thank you, buddy. Very much. See you, buddy. Talk to you later. Bye.